Short-termism is, in the long run, a disastrous approach to life. It can be so hard to plan ahead or to have a long-term big picture in mind as we live our daily lives, but long-term vision is as essential in life as it is on any journey, where we need to know not only where to plant our feet or which way to turn at the next junction, but where's our destination? And in which direction should we be looking to make progress? We used to plan journeys by looking at maps and having an idea of the overall route before we started. Now, most of us tend to put the destination into satnav and only think one step at a time. So if satnav crashes, we're left helpless. Sometimes the short term has to take over our thinking and our action. A child steps out into the road and we swerve to avoid them rather than sticking to our plan of not turning until we get to the next junction. Coronavirus threw a spanner in the works of many of our plans and we had to respond in an environment of uncertainty, unable to plan very far ahead because by the time we get to next month, so much might have changed again. With hindsight, we can criticise the government's approach at the start of the crisis, but at the time, we couldn't see any better than they could what was coming. In last week's prophecy, Isaiah spoke to both the long horizon and the short term. Eventually, Egypt would be included in God's people. But for now, says Isaiah, don't make an alliance with them, he warns the people of Judah, the leaders of Judah. In the short term, Egypt would be under God's judgment. In today's oracle, Isaiah speaks to Jerusalem. He calls it the Valley of Vision a puzzling kind of phrase. Normally a mountaintop is where you have longer vision and Jerusalem is on top of a hill so the title is ironic. A valley can be a dark place like the 23rd Psalms valley of the shadow of death and maybe Isaiah felt he was in a dark place like that as the Lord gave him a vision about Jerusalem and its future. He highlights four mistakes that could be seen in Jerusalem in his day, all arising from a short-sighted outlook. So what are those mistakes? The first one is celebrating short-term deliverance, but refusing to accept what lies ahead. Here's a bit of history. We'll read later on in Isaiah sometime, chapters 36 and 37, where the Assyrians, having defeated the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC and invaded Judah as well, besieged Jerusalem 20 years later. Those chapters are duplicated in 2 Kings 18 to 19 and also 2 Chronicles. They relate a very important event in the life of God's people. Isaiah foretells a rescue and his prophecy is fulfilled in and uh, Though Judah is remarkably delivered, God would then sadly hand them over to the Babylonians who would besiege and defeat Jerusalem in 597 BC, so after a hundred years, leading to its destruction ten years later. It's the terrible thing you can read about in 2 Kings 24. That's why Isaiah is weeping bitterly in verse 4. What about us? Do we have big celebrations over small short-term victories whilst burying our hand, heads in the sand about the long-term future? I don't claim to have the vision for how bad things will be socially, politically or economically as we move into what people keep calling the new normal. Maybe we should have more celebration over the survival of the NHS and the fall in infection rates and death rates. Or maybe there's worse to come. I don't know. But what the Lord has revealed to me 
and to you as well if you read his word, is an eternal perspective. You can't get more long term than that and the long term future for those who don't know our Lord and Saviour Jesus is desperately grim. There may be things we can do to help our community's short term needs and we can rejoice over any reduction in poverty, improvement in education, progress in addressing mental health, breakthroughs in medical research. But the thing that brings rejoicing in heaven, Jesus tells us, is when a sinner repents. The long term future for any believer in Jesus is wonderfully bright. Any church needs to remember this as we respond to the needs of society. There's a danger of churches in this country taking our eye off the ball as we support the government's message of stay alert, control the virus, save lives. Of course we must support that, but that's not all. We have something greater to offer as well saving lives or postponing death would be another way to put it is not our big long-term goal we can see a bigger need that people have and we have something to offer the world that is far more valuable the gospel of jesus which saves lives beyond death the second mistake Isaiah saw being made in Jerusalem was looking to human plans and resources but not acknowledging God as their supplier. The big achievement of King Hezekiah for which he is remembered is his tunnel. You can still walk along this tunnel under the old city of Jerusalem for half a kilometre. It has a gradient of 0.1%. It was hewn out of solid rock by teams of labourers with pickaxes from both ends of the tunnel. And nobody's quite sure how they managed to meet in the middle after this snaking route, presumably by some kind of sonic location, hitting the rock with hammers or something. It was an engineering marvel and brought Jerusalem a great sense of security. The purpose of the tunnel was to bring water from the protected Gihon Spring to the lower pool in the city and have its overflow drain away into the porous rock rather than out into the valley. So if an enemy besieged the city, those inside could last for ages with fresh water while the attackers had no access to water. It was a defensive masterstroke. Scholars reckon it was done in less than four years, maybe as little as nine months. Maybe it's possible that the revelry in verse two was celebration when the two teams of diggers met in the middle. At the same time, with the Assyrians looming and threatening to besiege, Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem frantically shored up their defences. They cannibalised people's houses in verse 10 for stone to bolster the walls. With walls, weapons and a water supply, who needed anything else? That was their problem. What looked like engineering and strategic prudent brilliance was the ultimate folly. God had promised to protect them. When he first gave the city to his people, God knew what water supply he had created for it. Hezekiah didn't create the water, he diverted it. Jerusalem became locked down into this near horizon of their own activism, which became the enemy of faith. There's nothing wrong with technology itself and nothing wrong with strategic th thinking. The people were using their God-given gifts, but the problem was they were relying on those gifts alone and forgetting God's promises. Well, there's a challenge to us again. Do we have this limited vision and DIY salvation? Sometimes we say, as long as I've got my health, that's the main thing. 
that's not the main thing. Or I just need to provide for my family and earn enough money to give them a secure future. We can't give them a secure future anyway. The best gift we can give our children and grandchildren is knowledge of the Lord Jesus, who can give them a secure future for eternity. The third mistake Isaiah saw in Jerusalem happened when people finally realised how desperate their situation was for the future. Fatalistic feasting in the face of danger, but no repenting and seeking God's mercy. Verse, 13, verse 12, the Lord, the Lord Almighty called you on that day to weep and to wail, to tear out your hair and put on sackcloth. But see, there is joy and revelry, slaughtering of cattle and killing of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, you say, for tomorrow we die. Whereas in the second mistake we saw activism, which was a denial of faith, now we see escapism and a denial of repentance. Oh, there's nothing we can do. God is punishing us. We're going to die, the people in Jerusalem were saying. Correct. So let's enjoy what we have left of life, eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Wrong. They'd been ignoring God, now they're still ignoring God. Do you remember the story of Jonah? Jonah went to that wicked city, Nineveh, which was the capital of Assyria, with the message from God, 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. There was nothing there that they could do to stop this judgment coming, and yet what did they do? They repented and cried out for God's mercy and God loves to show mercy. That's what the Lord is like. That's what annoyed the peevish Jonah. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. So what should the people of Jerusalem have done when they realised the city walls and water tunnel, tunnel weren't going to save them and there was nothing they could do to save themselves? They should have done what the people of Nineveh did and cast themselves on God's mercy. The people of Nineveh received God's mercy. He didn't send the threatened judgment as they should have done as Rahab the prostitute did when Jericho was destroyed and she and her family would, were saved. God loves to show mercy. He loves to treat us better than we deserve. Yes, he's a holy God and he does punish and we can't get ourselves out of that. But he's also compassionate and merciful and he can get us out of it. We just need to turn back to him as our king and ask for his mercy. Jesus died so that we could become God's friends. It's never too late unless we keep refusing the offer of his mercy. Sometimes I think the church today collaborates with the world's escapism. People don't want to hear about sin and forgiveness, we're told. They want to be uplifted and feel good about themselves the way they are. But if we shut up about sin and forgiveness, if we deprive people of the offer of life, we encourage them into this attitude of escapism, even where they're starting to recognise their desperate position before God, we owe it to everyone to introduce them to God's mercy. And the fourth error in Jerusalem, building a name and reputation for oneself, but not recognising one's total dependence on the Lord. One individual exemplified this attitude that was seen in Jerusalem. His name was Shebna. 
he was in charge of the palace. We find that Hezekiah's tunnel wasn't the only expression of faithlessness hewn into the solid rock under the city. Uh, Shebna's love of pomp went as far as planning a tomb fit for a king for himself. In contrast, another court official called Eliakim shows the characteristics of a true leader. Look how they compare and this table coming up. Some of you could just click through all the things on the table. Here they are. The things that you can see in the passage uh, contrasting Shebna and Eliakim, one who's disgraced and one is honoured because one is self-regarding, one is servant of the Lord. Eliakim is the one who is like a, a peg, a reliable one fixed in the wall. He's so ideal as one of the leaders. And so there's a sad surprise in verse 24. In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, the peg driven into the firm place will give way. It will be sheared off and will fall and the load hanging on it will be cut down. The Lord has spoken. Maybe it's Eliakim's own weakness. Maybe it's the failings of his family who hang on his glory like heavy items on the peg on the wall. But he is not up to the job of bearing the full weight of government of God's people. This is something that keeps happening all through the Old Testament. You keep getting what looks like an ideal leader and they turn out not to be ideal. Isaiah has already told us back in chapter 7 what we need. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. His name means God with us. When he comes, Isaiah sees in chapter 9, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. We need Emmanuel, just as the people of Jerusalem needed Emmanuel. Thank God he has sent us exactly what we need, or rather exactly who we need. God is with us. Emmanuel is Jesus. Jesus.